Hello, I'm Doug Sweetser, and this is a talk I gave titled Two Just Funny Uses for a Quaternion Squared. And you see graphics for those two. One should look very familiar. It is the uh, light cone from special relativity. And we've got these lines of invariant intervals. And then we've got this graph in green. Hmm, <laughs> what's that? Well, it should look like the light cone rotated by 45 degrees, which it really is. And these are constant imaginary values of space times time that nobody uses. But they might be very interesting indeed. The talk was given at the 19th in, uh, Eastern Gravity Meeting in uh, Durham, New Hampshire in May of 2016. There were, I don't know, 30 or 40 folks in the audience. Nearly all of them were professionals in general relativity. So no idea is new. If you come up with one, well, you really should look on the internet <laughs> for it. And when I came up with this idea in the spring of 2015, I found this on Physics Stack Exchange. And so this person was it was Isaac wrote, I recently realized that a quaternion could be used to write intervals or norms of vectors in special relativity. And he's got this thing squared and he's got t squared minus x squared minus y squared minus z squared. Is this useful? Is it used? Does it bring anything, or is it just funny? Well, the question as asked is actually gibberish at a bunch of different levels. <laughs> I mean, the norm is like positive, uh, all those values, um, but the square is not. Okay, but even more basic than that is that a quaternion times a quaternion yields a quaternion. Okay, and so there's going to be this 2 dt dx, 2 dt dy, 2 dt dz. And I like to get my units right, so I put in the factors of c as needed. And it's like, look at that part in blue. That is the invariant interval of special relativity. It's just there. And in fact, in 1997, when I first saw that, I purchased quaternions.com. <laughs> so I didn't think that was by anything by chance. Nature was saying something, and now I own it. <laughs> but what about the other term? I mean, it should be just as important, right? Hmm. Well, the answers... Um, that were provided in that thread at Physics Stack Exchange were just about math, uh, not physics. Um, and this fellow Lobos Moitel, whose name I'm probably mispronouncing because I don't do Czech or or whatever the little country he comes from in the center of uh, Europe. Um, but I actually always bet against Lobos. Um, I f have found him to be very professional in high energy physics, but if he goes beyond that little bit and you know pro projects what he thinks is right, uh, no, not so good in my opinion. Um, now he does have a lot of these reputation points. Uh, as you can see, he's got 126,000 right there. Uh, last time I checked, he was over 130,000. Uh, I've moved from 29, not 1,000, 29, just 29, <laughs> to 34 last time I checked. So he is, um, he is much more prolific and, um, and busy on the Internet. I got a full-time job and wife and, you know, family, that kind of stuff. <sighs> oh, well. Okay, so the big question is WWED what would Einstein do? And Abraham uh, Pays wrote uh, this great um, scientific biography, Subtle is the Lord, 
if you really want to learn the nuts and bolts of, of his accomplishments, uh, it's, it's well worth the read. It's very informative. And not glowing, you know, it's, it's technically spot on. And this was in the introduction, and it made an impact when I read it. Had I to compose a one-sentence scientific biography of him, I would write, Better than anyone before or after him, he knew how to invent invariance principles and make use of statistical fluctuations. So I put in the bold because that thing in light blue, that is special relativity. The in, that invariance. That's what we agree upon. And what about if the thing in green was invariant. Hmm. And that is what I started to investigate in the spring of 2015. So this proposal uses equivalence classes for both special relativity and my new proposal quaternion gravity, or sometimes I call it space times time invariance as gravity. All right, so special relativity, you got two observers, they're equivalent if the real part of the square of the interval written using uh, quaternions is identical. The observers may differ by a constant velocity. In other words, they're moving at relative speed to each other. And as a matter of fact, the space times time terms, the ones that don't agree, can be used to figure out exactly how the two observers are moving compared to each other, which is actually kind of useful. <laughs> so why don't they people do this? Oh, that's right. People hate quaternions. I forgot. Okay. So for quaternion gravity, oh, what did I change here? The, the only thing I changed here was going from r saying that the real parts were equal to saying the three imaginary parts were equal. So two observers are equivalent if the imaginary parts of the square of the interval using the quaternion are identical. The two observers may only differ by a fixed distance from a gravitational source. Now you might go, well, um, they could, couldn't they be more complicated like spinning and stuff? Yeah, you can always make things more complicated. Let's see if we can establish this much. You know, get a get a toehold on the beach, as it were. So let's talk a little bit more about equivalence classes because it's it, it's a math thing that we go, oh well, that's really easy. Uh, yeah, but you know, math guys like to be precise, and so so with the equivalence classes are very precise things. So the past and the future are two equivalence classes, and they're separated by now. So space-time, it's got time, it's got, th I, I, I'm lumping the three dimensions of space together, um, but it's like everything that has ever happened in the universe, or ever will happen in the universe. So, <laughs> it really covers a lot. No, actually it covers everything, okay? Some of the stuff you'll never get to, you know, outside the light cone, fine. You're, you're never getting there. Uh, but includes absolutely everything. So that sounds like a good place to start. Uh, and we have this moment of now, and if it is in the past, then the real part of that is going to be negative. And if you've got two values that are negative, well, then they're both in the past. They're both in the past equivalence class, that dark gray box. Whereas if they're in the future, they both are um, have a positive real value. I mean, it's very simple. Now, this has, says nothing about whether you know we're simultaneous. We're not worrying about that. We're just saying for a particular observer, they can use now to slice spacetime into a very big past, 13.6 billion years old, uh, and the future. Well, that's going to be probably even bigger than that. We can also separate left and right, okay, 
and we're going to use here dr equals zero to separate them. And we're going to also be able to do up versus down and near versus far. But it's the same thing, only we're dealing with imaginary values at this point. So if we're thinking now about time-like and space-like events, the stuff of special relativity, that we have to deal with squares. And we are only considering the real part of the square. And if the real part of the square is a positive number, then we say the two events are separated by a time-like event. I mean, they have a time-like uh, relationship between the two events. If the real part now that doesn't tell, say whether the the whether it's in the upper light cone or the lower light cone to get that information you compare not the square but this guy okay the linear thing so you have to combine these sorts of things and if it's space like then the, the then when we square it and the, if the square is negative then it's going to be either left or right, or up or down, or near or far. All right, that's all well and good. Those, and it's the separation this time is not now, it's the light cone. It's where the square actually equals zero, and only light can travel along that. All right, so what the quaternion gravity uh, proposal uses is here and now to separate events. And so I call this the imaginary twin of special relativity. And to be honest, if it wasn't so conceptually close to exactly what happens in special relativity, I wouldn't feel as confident as I do. Because this, the difference right here, now you, it, if you go back here, it's we're real values of p squared, and here we're imaginary values of p squared. And, uh, you know, if those are equal, then we're going to be saying that, gee, I think these are just are different heights in a gravitational field. Uh, all right. So, uh, so when I was doing, when I was drawing these up, uh, I thought, well, how many other simple functions can I do with um, with just a couple of qu quaternions. And an obvious thing is to form the norm, okay? And so I'm thinking about zero, and I'm thinking about one, and so, well, of course, zero goes in the middle, and we go one unit away, and, well, we would separate space-time again. And that has that a unit circle in the complex plane well, that's actually u1. And and that's kind of... <laughs> I don't understand this, which is kind of cool, because it's not a complicated little graph. It's just a dot and a circle, okay? But that is u1 symmetry. u1 symmetry is the gauge symmetry of, uh, of electromagnetism. So it's... Is in that we've got, got this kind of discrete. I don't know. I, maybe I shouldn't say it's discrete, but it, it's it's starting to sound like maybe this is this is this is a graph that's related to EM. And what's kind of interesting about it to me, look, that's a space-time diagram. There are things that can't communicate with each other. Well, how are they forming this circle? And it's like, well, they are, and they must be more than one particle which is a deep lesson you learn from relativistic quantum field theory, is that you better not think about it as one particle. You're never going to understand it. This little circle has that quality. It can't be formed by a particle. It has to be a bunch of particles who decide, yeah, we're going to do this, uh, this, this kind of uh, graph. Hmm. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, well, to continue the theme, <laughs> okay? Um, well, what if I didn't treat this as like dr, but as dx, dy, dz? I had my, my three little things in there. 
that would be uh, that would be um, the symmetry of a SU two, in fact, unitary quaternions, um, and and believe me, I this this starts to go like way over my head. <laughs> <laughs> I've I haven't done a single calculation using the weak force, um, and yet it's there. I mean, there's no denying that just drawing a sphere with uh, dx, dy, dz, you've got u1 symmetry. Uh, sorry, su2 symmetry, which is uh, the gauge symmetry of the weak force. And it's like, wow, that's that's kind of cool. I I can still actually see u1, and now I can see su2. <laughs> uh, and you can actually combine equivalence classes and it's like whoa <laughs> that seems uh, that seems a bit much um, but uh, what I like to do is think about classical physics uh, classical physics time and space don't rotate to, into each other and you get nice square kind of stuff going on and if you say hey no let's let's think about all these things going on at once which i think is what relativistic quantum field theory is like it's like i bet that's crazy and it's like yeah look at that diagram <laughs> i mean it's reasonable right but wow i wonder how anybody figures out what's really going on there uh but i know it's got u1 symmetry i know it's got su2 uh, symmetry now it doesn't have um SU3, sorry, it doesn't have SU3 symmetry. Just, and I don't think it ever will. I don't think there's a way to force that one in there. Uh, it might have the symmetry of the quaternion group Q8, which has eight unit vectors to it, but uh, that's, again, that's if I thought it was too hard to do the weak force, uh, strong force is, uh, is another three levels up. All right, so, um, but the relativity is. The relativity of simultaneity can now be seen by um, by these two-tone equivalence classes, I call them. This is where you take your um, space-like separation, which has to do with uh, Q uh, uh, quaternion squared, and you overlap onto that the t uh, future versus the past, which is a linear sort of thing, and you see that the future time-like light cone it's it's all monotone light uh, yellow, whereas the past is this dark yellow, but it's all the same color. Whereas the the um, the the left and the right space like uh, light cones, they actually have two tones. So what that really means is like one person's going to say this one's in front of that event, and the other tone say no, I think uh, I think that one came first, and then the other one. Um, and there's um, a similar kind of thing that can be done um, with two-tone time-like events where you don't know which one um, happened to the left or right or up or down of the other one, you know, the observers. Um, that's for uh, time-like separated events. All right. So on the other hand, gravity is kind of monolithic. And that's actually one of the more interesting properties of it. It's like, yeah, I, I don't care what's going on. It, it's, it's attractive. You can't trip me up and, and do do something strange like that. Um, all right. So, uh, so basically, you know, dealing with special relativity and gravity are now both problems in algebra, uh, not field theory. So, I mean, that's great. In a certain way, because it means that uh, there's no field, uh, there's no graviton, and there's no quantum gravity. I mean, <laughs> I say that's great, but I know there, there are people whose jobs uh, are about investigating uh, quantum gravity, and I'm saying uh, no. It's, it's special relativity doesn't have a special particle. It just is the mathematical rules of the road everybody has to obey, and likewise for space times time invariance is gravity there's not going to be a particle there's not a metric involved with quaternions so there's not a question about varying that metric tensor depending on the space time curvature it's like if you 
keep this thing invariant, you're moving up and down in a gravitational field. I mean, the math is, is far simpler, uh, but it's also more dense. It's a, a lot of things are happening in a very small amount of mathematical space. <laughs> uh, that All that group stuff where you can see U1 symmetry, SU2 symmetry, and you can't see SU3, but the quaternion group. Oh my goodness. I, I don't know how to manage that density myself. Uh, the bad thing about this, I don't use tensors like anywhere. And yet everybody uses tensors everywhere. And so you'd have to replace just about everything. And that's something I can't do on my own. <laughs> but if you want to see the slides uh, for this, uh, download them. I do this bit.ly slash VP. That stands for visual physics, a, a little uh, favorite thing of mine to think about. Uh, so it's dash JF, just funny. Um, the main uh, outreach uh, uh, thing I have is uh, VP dash QG. Uh, which has this little kind of animation, which has, um, you can see the special relativity girls just kind of walking, uh, whereas the ones involved with a constant um, space times time is that balloon girl who's flying high in a gravity field and that guy just kind of laying down low in the gravity field. And there's a, a good little um, video that goes along with it to kind of give you a sense of what's going on there. And the main site is, as I say, quaternions.com, which is hosted over on GitHub. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed. Oh, oh, so so, what was the reaction of the crowd? Of professional physicists. It was complete silence. There wasn't any questions asked. And I hung around another full day. And they, I mean, they, they were all polite. They were all professional. Uh, but not a single question about this particular talk because it's not what people who are professionals in, <laughs> in, uh, in gravity do these days. They get into incredibly difficult computational problems. Uh, they get into d incredibly difficult conceptual problems of getting general relativity to work with something else if this proposal is correct, it is direct competition with general relativity. And it says general relativity was an amazing accomplishment and it all has to be replaced. And nobody wants to think about that. Um, but anyway, I hope you enjoyed this talk. Thank you very much.